Good morning. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Madam Ambassador is with us this morning, Madam Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador Makarova. <laughs> Mr. President, it is my honor to present to you the Congress of the United States, which has great respect and admiration and appreciation for your courageous leadership. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, Slava Ukraina. Slava Ukraina. Glory to hear us. My colleagues, Slava Ukraina. Slava Ukraina. Glory to heroes. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, members of the Congress, ladies and gentlemen, Americans, friends, I am proud to greet you from Ukraine, from our capital city of Kyiv, a city that is under missile and airstrikes from Russian troops every day, but it doesn't give up. And we have not even thought about it for a second just like many other cities and communities in our beautiful country, which found themselves in the worst war since World War II. I have the honor to greet you on behalf of the Ukrainian people, brave and freedom-loving people who for eight years have been resisting the Russian aggression. Those who give their best sons and daughters to stop this full-scale Russian invasion. Right now, the destiny of our country is being decided. The destiny of our people, whether Ukrainians will be free, whether they will be able to preserve their democracy. Russia has attacked not just us, not just our land, not just our cities, it went on a brutal offensive against our values, basic human values. It threw tanks and planes against our freedom, against our right to live freely in our own country, choosing our own future. Against our desire for happiness, against our national dreams, just like the same dreams you have, you, Americans, just like anyone else in the United States. I remember your national memorial in Rushmore, the faces of your prominent presidents, those who laid the foundation of the United States of America as it is today, democracy, independence, freedom, and care for everyone, for every person, for everyone who works diligently, who lives honestly, who respects the law. We in Ukraine want the same for our people. All that is normal part of your own life. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, Americans, in your great history, you have pages that would allow you to understand Ukrainians, understand us now when you need it right now, when we need you right now. Remember Pearl Harbor, terrible morning of December 7, 1941, when your sky was black from the planes attacking you. Just remember it. Remember September the 11th, a terrible day in 20, 2001, when evil tried to turn your cities, independent territories, in battlefields, when innocent people were attacked, attacked from air, yes, just like no one else expected it. You could not stop it. Our country 
experience the same every day. Right now, at this moment, every night, for three weeks now, various Ukrainian cities, Odessa and Kharkiv, Chernihiv and Sumy, Zhitomir and Lviv, Mariupol and Dnipro, Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death for thousands of people. Russian troops have already fired nearly 1,000 missiles at Ukraine, countless bombs. They use drones to kill us with precision. This is a terror that Europe has not seen, has not seen for 80 years, and we are asking for a reply, for an answer uh, to this uh, terror from the whole world. Is this a lot to ask for, to create a no-fly zone, zone over Ukraine to save people? Is this too much to ask? Humanitarian no-fly zone, something that Ukraine, uh, that Russia would not be able to terrorize our free cities. If this is too much to ask, we offer an alternative. You know what kind of defense systems we need, S-300 and other similar systems. You know how much depends on the battlefield, on the ability to use aircraft, powerful, strong air uh, aviation to protect our people, our freedom, our land, aircraft that can help Ukraine, help Europe. And you know that they exist and you have them, but they are on Earth, not in, Ukra in the Ukrainian sky. They do not defend our people. I have a dream. These words are known to each of you today. I can say, I have a need. I need to protect uh, our sky. I need your decision, your help, which means exactly the same, the same you feel when you hear the words, I have a dream. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, Ukraine is grateful to the United States for its overwhelming support for everything that your government and your people have done for us, for weapons and ammunition, for training, for finances, for leadership in the free world, which helps us to pressure the aggressor economically. I'm grateful to President Biden for his personal involvement, for his sincere commitment to the defense of Ukraine and democracy all over the world. I am grateful to you for the resolution which recognizes all those who commit crimes against Ukraine, against the Ukrainian people as war criminals. However, now, it is true, in the darkest time for our country, for the whole Europe, I call on you to do more. New packages of sanctions are needed constantly, every week, until the Russian military machine stops. Restrictions are needed for everyone on whom this unjust regime is based. We propose that the United States sanctions all politicians in the Russian Federation who remain in their offices and do not uh, uh, cut ties with those who are responsible for the aggression against Ukraine, from uh, state Duma's members to the last official who has lack of morale to break the state terror. All Americans' company must leave Russia from their market, leave their market, immediately because it is flooded with our blood. Ladies and gentlemen, members of Congress, please take the lead. If you have companies in your districts who um, finance the Russian military machine leaving business in Russia, you should put pressure. I am asking to make sure that the Russians do not receive a single penny that they use to destroy people in Ukraine the destruction of our country, the destruction of Europe. All American ports should be closed for uh, Russian goods. We, um, peace is more important than income, and we have to defend this principle in the whole world. We already became part of the anti-war coalition, a big anti-war coalition that unites many countries, dozens of countries, those who reacted to, in principle, to President Putin's decision to invade our country, but we need to move on and do more. We need to create 
new tools to respond quickly and stop the war, the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, which began on February 24th. And it would be fair if it ended in a day, in 24 hours, that evil would be punished immediately. To today, the world does not have such tools. The war of the past have prompted our predecessors to create institutions that should protect us from war, but they unfortunately don't work. We see it, you see it, so we need new ones, new institutions, new alliances, and we offer them. We propose to create an association, U24, United for Peace, a union of responsible countries that have the strength and cons consciousness to stop conflicts immediately, provide all the necessary assistance in 24 hours, if necessary, even weapons, if necessary, sanctions, humanitarian support, political support, finances, everything you need to keep the peace and quickly save the world to save lives. In addition, such association, such union could provide assistance to those who are experiencing natural disasters, man-made disasters, who fell victims to humanitarian crisis or epidemics. Remember how difficult it was for the world to do the simplest thing, just to give vaccines, vaccines against COVID to save lives, to prevent new strains. The world spent months, years doing things like that much faster to make sure there are no human losses, no victims. Ladies and gentlemen, Americans, if such alliance would exist today, that is U24, we would be able to save thousands of lives in our country. In many countries of the world, those who need peace, those who suffer inhumane destruction. I ask you to watch one video, video of what the Russian troops did in our country, in our land. We have to stop it. We must prevent it, preventively destroy every single aggressor who seeks to subjugate other nations. Please watch the video.
and in the end to sum it up today today it's not enough to be the leader of the nation today it takes to be the leader of the world being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace peace in your country doesn't depend anymore only on you and your people it depends on those next to you on those who are strong strong doesn't mean weak strong is brave and ready to fight for the life of his citizens and citizens of the world for human rights for freedom for the right to live decently and to die when your time comes and not when it's wanted by someone else by your neighbor today the ukrainian people are defending not only ukraine we are fighting for the values of europe and the world sacrificing our lives in the name of the future that's why today the american people are helping not just ukraine but europe and the world to keep the planet alive to keep justice in history now i'm almost 45 years old today my age stopped when the hearts of more than 100 children stopped beating i see no sense in life if it cannot stop the death and this is my main mission as the leader of my people great ukrainians and as the leader of my nation i am addressing the president biden you are the leader of the nation of your great nation i wish you to be the leader of the world being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace thank you slava ukraine glory to ukraine for your support. Um, President Zelensky just addressed the Congress and he addressed the United States. Every mom and dad uh, with all sorts of discretion for the littlest ones should watch that video with their family. Everybody knows who Zelensky is. The man has the courage of his convictions. Everybody knows who Putin is. He believes in murdering women and children. You can see it in the video. What Zelensky asked President Biden and the United States Congress to do is answer whether we have the courage of our convictions. Zelensky needs to win. The Ukrainian freedom fighters need to win. We don't need them just to lose more slowly. We need them to win. And to win, they need to kill Russians. And to kill Russians, they need more weapons. 
the burden of proof should be on us about why we wouldn't supply everything they need. They need more javelins, they need more ammo, they need more stingers, they need more SAMs, they need more airplanes, they need more of everything, and they're fighting not just for their kids and their future, they're fighting for the free world. Zelensky has the courage of his convictions. The question he asked the Congress and the United States government is, will we have the courage of ours? We're a superpower. We should act like it. He specifically asked for a no-fly zone. Did the U.S. do that? We should have gotten them planes long ago. I think one thing that came out of that is throughout the entire conflict, we have had this assumption with our intel community, with all the briefings we get, that it's just a matter of time when they're going to lose. That's been the underlying assumption from our intel community, and I'm not blaming them. It's been a lot of people's assumption. When that happens, then all decisions that we make in our government are based on that idea. They're going to lose eventually. I think we need to change that underlying dynamic, particularly when you see a rousing, inspiring speech like that, which is they could win. They could win. Maybe not great chances, but they could win. And if we start thinking like that, I think the options that we are considering as a government change. And I think that's actually really important. It's an insight that I will say my friend Sheldon Whitehouse gave to me. But it's a really important one. And I think it's a bipartisan concern that we can all start rethinking how we're even framing this conflict. Victory. Thank you. President Zelensky was powerful and persuasive again, as he always is when I'm talking to him when he's called us as members of the Senate and the House. Uh, heartbreaking to watch that video, but uh, the picture tells a thousand words, and in this case, it tells a story of deliberately targeting civilian. Clearly, war crimes have been committed. It tells the story of freedom being fought on the border of Ukraine and Russia and throughout that country. And it tells us that we have to do more. Is the President specifically asked today for help to close the skies. And if it's not a no-fly zone, then give them the ability to protect themselves. That's why he talked about the anti-aircraft systems like the S-300, which are in various countries, former Warsaw Pact countries that could be facilitated by us to get into Ukraine. That's why he talked about the planes again. That's why he talked about the need for them to have the weapons to be able to use the anti-aircraft, anti-missile technology that they have. So we need to figure this out. We need to be creative. We need to take the funding that Congress has now provided and use it in the most effective way to protect against the civilian casualties that we saw today in that powerful video. 
is there this any? is, I mean, so you said it, but if not a no-fly zone, so what is, in your estimation, the, the most appropriate thing to meet his request? Is it the F-300? Is it no-fly well, zone? There are, there are various anti-missile, anti-aircraft systems uh, in the region that can be effective. The S-300 is one. They already have it. They know how to use it. They need more weapons to use their own systems. In other words, more, more missiles, more armaments. Uh, they need everything. But immediately what we should do is be creative, figure out ways to facilitate the transfer of these weapons into Ukraine immediately. We still have access to the country to be able to do that before it's too late, before more people are killed, before Kiev falls, before Kharkiv is reduced to rubble. We have to act and act quickly. It's not a matter of weeks. It's a matter of hours he and days. He also called for uh, sanctions that we have been unwilling to impose. We've imposed a lot of sanctions. But he called for basically a shutdown of any Russian imports and, and a much stronger sanctions package. I know that you've been working on that, but the administration has been resisting. Yeah, we need to tighten the sanctions. He talked specifically about broadening the sanctions to governmental officials who are engaged and involved in this in some way or another, including regional officials. I think that's a good idea. I've talked to the ambassador about that over the last couple of days. Uh, my sense is that um, the American people are ready to do more. And that includes being honest about the oil and gas situation. Right now, the revenues that Russia is getting from oil and gas sales around the world is what's fueling this war machine. That's their number one export. And so there's more we can do there. As an example, we put sanctions on banks um, as it relates to energy transactions. We said they don't go into effect until June 24th. June 24th may be too late to do anything. So we need to tighten these sanctions on the banks, include them all in SWIFT. Uh, do more in terms of sanctioning individuals. And today I would make a statement to those Russian officials and to those Russian commanders. You have a choice. The war crimes are being recorded. The world is watching. You have a choice. You don't need to obey these orders to kill your neighbors, innocent civilians in Ukraine. My hope is that what comes out of today's discussion with President Zelensky and all of us working together on a bipartisan basis is to tighten the sanctions immediately, is to provide more armaments that they actually need to defend themselves, particularly from these bombardments that are happening nightly, and give them a fighting chance to protect themselves. Thank you, sir. Heads up. Um, I thought President Zelensky was very powerful, as many of you watched. He made the case very strongly. Um, when you think about what President Biden should do, I think there's a bipartisan movement right here. Provide them the MiGs. Provide them the planes where they can create a no-fly zone. Provide them the armament that they need to continue to fight a, a war that they did not create. I thought the video was one of the most moving moments in there. Made the case of the murdering of innocent people that war crimes are being committed, that America and the world cannot sit by and ignore. We need to put a stop to this. And I think greater pressure, greater armament, and why the MiGs were not provided weeks ago, as many of us requested, put them at a disadvantage. Is there any scenario where a no-fly zone, the no-fly zone that he requested would be supported by you and by the United States? Look, I think right now, provide them the MiGs that they can, that they can create a no-fly zone. The entire time, speaking with those in Ukraine and the President himself, he's never asked for American men or women to be in a battle. All he's ever asked for is give us the opportunity to defend ourselves. Don't let us fight with sticks. I've had conversations with the President long before this moment came. My advice to him was provide them the armament earlier to deter Putin from ever making this decision. And the entire time, President Biden always said it would be the sanctions afterwards. And then when the sanctions came, he said it'd take months to work. Well, Ukrainian people cannot wait months. The world cannot wait months if we sit by and watch innocent people being murdered. With that, let me turn it over to our whip. Thank you. President Zelensky just gave an incredibly powerful address to Congress. And I think people got to see once again what we've been seeing for weeks, and that is just why President Zelensky is inspiring the people of Ukraine 
and people all around the world who are rallying behind these strong, incredibly tough people during a brutally, uh, brutally diff difficult invasion by Putin. Uh, when President Zelensky showed that video, uh, you really got to see firsthand the, the sheer brutality uh, of what Putin is doing inside Ukraine. It was very difficult to watch. It was heartbreaking. Uh, but it shows you that there's nothing less than genocide going on in Ukraine uh, by Putin and his army. And so as Zelensky made a plea to the United States, to President Biden, he's continued to reiterate that the people of Ukraine just want more tools to be able to defend their country, especially right now to be able to control the sky. And that's why getting these MiGs in immediately is so critical. The longer President Biden waits trying to figure out excuses to not offend Putin. Uh, it's, it's costing lives in Ukraine. He's got to make that happen. It's a, a plea Zelensky continued to make, uh, as well as a plea for other things uh, that I, I think the American people want to do to give them the tools that they need to defend their country. Uh, so as, as we look where we are, this is another opportunity for America to step up to and take away Putin's leverage on energy. There's no reason that Putin should be pocketing hundreds of millions of dollars a day by selling oil to America and the United States uh, when we could cut that off right now uh, by opening up our reserves, opening up areas that have been closed uh, by President Biden to leasing so that Putin does not have that leverage over America or Europe to finance this brutal invasion. So we're going to continue to stand with the people of Ukraine and pray for them that they're able to have the tools to defend themselves against what Putin's doing. Now turn it over to our conference chair, Elise Stefan. The American people stand strongly with the people of Ukraine. The speech we just heard from President Zelensky was inspiring and talk about a leader who has risen to a catastrophic challenge and a catastrophic crisis in his country. He outlined the fact that this is the most significant national security crisis in Europe since the end of World War II. The stakes could not be higher. This administration has been far too slow, not only in their implementation of sanctions, but the lack of completeness of sanctions. The Ukrainian people need those MiGs, and they need them now. They needed them yesterday. House Republicans have been united in advocating for strong, tough sanctions for months predating the invasion. We stand strongly in support of MiGs and making sure that the weapons and ammunition that is needed get to the Ukrainian people as quickly as possible. And just as a new mom, it is heart-wrenching to watch the video that uh, President Zelensky just played in terms of the bombing of maternity wards and the war crimes that are being committed today. Make no mistake, there will be consequences on the global stage for Vladimir Putin, who is a war criminal and a thug. And I'll turn it over to our leader, Kevin McCarthy. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, how, how does the, the conference propose transferring the mix from, from Poland to, to the Ukrainians in terms of what's been discussed and what, what is the proposal that, that you all believe should be I think we can move forward exactly as they said. If they transfer it to America, it's no different than us providing the javelins or others. The problem is the delay. The problem is this administration has delayed time and again, creating this situation to be worse, giving the wrong message to Putin. When President Biden said in his press conference, well, if they take a little part of Ukraine, as though that was okay. The slowness of moving weaponry to Ukraine to have a determent where Russia would not invade. All of that's been a mistake. The weeks that he has waited now about whether the MiGs could go. How many people have died? Maternity wards have been bombed. You've watched in the video itself. You've watched a leader stand in a capital that's being bombed, not requesting that American men and women go into war simply help us provide the weapons that we can defend ourselves. This is an unwarranted war that they did not ask for, but they're willing to defend the right of freedom. We should stand with anyone that's willing to defend freedom and against the atrocities that Putin is doing. Thank you all very much. I think walking into that room ahead of time, I believe there was a bipartisan support to provide the MIGs. Um, I know on the Republican side, we've been requesting this for quite some time. I think that has changed on the Democrat side, that they're more supportive of it now. Um, I think that room's united to defend and help um, Ukraine get the weaponry they need to defend themselves. Leader McCarthy, you also called for much tougher sanctions. Uh, Rob Corbyn, who just came back from Poland, is calling for much tougher sanctions on their global, uh, Russia's global 
energy revenue, not just you know, banning their oil imports here, but he wants much tougher sanctions, basically no Russian products coming into the United States and on banks, etc. The administration hasn't been willing to go there yet. Wondering if there's bipartisan support, do you think, in Congress to do something like that? I believe there is. We should strengthen our sanctions every single day Putin continues his murder until he stops. But we should do more than that. Provide them the MiG so they can have a no-fly zone created by themselves with their, with their own pilots. Let them defend themselves. That's all they're asking for. But let's ramp up the sanctions as well so Putin and the rest of them feel the pain of the murders they are causing. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Let me just say that Mike McCall and I are here I'm not here as a Democrat today. And you'll hear from him, he's not here as a Republican, we're here as Americans. And after seeing and listening to President Zelensky, if we don't come together as Americans and with our NATO allies, then that helps Putin win. This is about the time for unity. And listening to the plea of President Zelensky to make sure that we are giving him everything that he needs. The one that's responsible for this humanitarian disaster is the evilness of Vladimir Putin. He's the one that we should all be focused on stopping and making sure that we're saving the lives of the Ukrainian people. <clears throat> so in answers to questions as to whether or not we should continue to, you know, as we did last week, close to $14 billion for weapons and humanitarian aid, another $200, $300 million, the money should not be an issue with the United States Congress in a bipartisan way. That vote was us together. We win this and we stand with President Zelensky by doing it together. When we went over, Mr. McCall and I, to Poland just about a week ago, a little over a week ago, we went there with one message to our allies in Poland, and to our allies in NATO, and of course, the Ukrainian people. We're going to stand with President Zelensky, and we're going to do it together as Americans. Thank you, uh, thank you Chairman. Uh, as uh, Chairman Meek said, we're not standing here as uh, Republicans, Democrats. This is not a time for partisan rhetoric. This is a time to unify as a nation behind Ukraine against one of the most evil forces we have seen since my father's war, and that's World War II, Adolf Hitler. Um, so we're working together. We went on a trip to Poland together with a group, a delegation, the most politically diverse uh, membership, but we all came back solidified in solidarity that we need to help Ukraine, give them everything they need to fight this war. And the video we saw was very reminiscent of Nazi Germany. Mm. And it's happening today in our lifetime, and I never thought it would. It happened in my father's lifetime, but I never thought I would see this happen in my lifetime. And history will judge us. What did you do? What did you do when the bombing started? When the maternity hospitals were bombed and the pregnant women were taken out blood with children, what did you do? History will judge us if we don't act now and if we don't act strongly. So I stand with the chairman, and our committee is a committee, and we've been working behind the scenes ever since we got back to get the weapons that they need into Ukraine. We met with the 82nd Airborne who bring the weapons into Ukraine from Poland in an undisclosed location. 
You know what in the Russian intelligence they're bombing across the border? We need to hit back. And we can do that by supplying them the arms they need, but we need to do it now. We are doing it now, and we need to do more right now. What, and with that, um, what so what specifically? What kind of what specific arms are we <coughs> providing them to close the uh, to close the skies? If we're not going to support closing, or you, you know, a um, I, just no lethal lethal drones, S three hundreds. That's like our Patriot anti aircraft. Yes, I would like the MIGs to go in. It's symbolic. Would it mean a whole? It would mean a lot to. to President Zelensky, who gave a tremendous speech. Uh, the initial plan was to send them, the pilots would come into Poland, fly over the border, not sure what happened. That's unfortunate, that's symbolic. But the lethal drones and the S-300s are absolutely paramount. S-300s are in, but we need a lot more. Chairman? And what we're doing is looking at all of our allies and all across the world of countries that have some of the equipment now some of the drones, you've seen Turkey step up. And Mr. McCall and I, again, collectively, we've met with the Turkish ambassador. We're meeting with ambassadors and people across the world that are our allies so that we can get these weapons into Ukraine immediately. That's what's needed. And as he said, the S-300s are absolutely important. When we left Poland, we thought the deal was done. We had the plan. I don't think anybody necessarily was agreed or disagreed with the MiGs. We thought that they would come, the pilots, Ukraine pilots, would come into Poland and take the planes out. Somehow the, plane, the plan changed, and we talked about them going to Germany first, to our base, and then going back there. The plan of working together to get the S-300s continued, and there was still dialogue going along, including with our allies. Because the strength in this, and we do need to dial up sanctions, but dial them up and make sure that our allies are with us, because the way sanctions work is multilaterally with all of our allies. And just as we need all of our allies, we need every member of Congress, House and Senate, Democrat, Republicans, and Independents, to stand together and to speak and give one voice and one message, which is exactly what President Zelensky is doing. And I do believe with that, we can close those skies and start saving the lives and stop the bombing of the evil Vladimir Putin. Is there ever a time for a no-fly zone? I mean, if this continues for months on end, um, it's clearly what Zelensky wants. Is there ever a time where, where the United States should be doing that? You know, it, I, I think you're referencing red lines. And I think we need to start looking at red lines. What are some of the red lines? You know, uh, are, when they use chemical weapons, which will come next, like they did in Syria, are we gonna stand back as a nation Zelensky said, you're the leader of the world, you're the leader of peace. Are we going to sit back and watch that? That, that humanitarian crisis? The, the weapons of mass destruction. What about short-range tactical nukes? Is that going to be a red line? If Putin gets so desperate, backed into a corner, he launches those. Is that a red line? I think we need to start asking these questions. You know, we have one hand tied behind our back and one hand reaching out. And I think a lot of Americans, we don't want to just sit back and watch a boy hit the little kid on the playground. At what point is a red line crossed? Mr. Chairman, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that what's happening now, and part of the reason why I believe that the president is going to go to Europe to talk to our allies, to make sure that they are collectively together. Because I agree, we just can't sit back and watch chemical weapons or nuclear weapons to be utilized. But what that conversation and some of the dialogue that's going on is to bring us together, that same unity that I'm talking about, so that we know we saw going in, for example, with a number of the other sanctions, what has made that successful and starting to squeeze is the fact that it's not unilaterally, it's multilaterally. 
And that dialogue, and we, and as Putin continues to move, I couldn't agree more with Mr. With other with Mr. McCall, that then the United States and the rest of the world will stand together to say that ain't gonna happen. A lot of Americans who are watching that have not. Um, what did you think of the video, and did you think it was an effective tool for him to push his plea for a no-fly zone? Look, if they had come to us to Poland when we were there, I want the American people to see it. When you saw the streams of refugees coming across that border, women and children, just with a bag, that's all they had with them, hungry. Some of them walked in the cold for days. Many of us couldn't stop but crying. We had Congresswoman Ann Wagner with us, who just broke down giving a kid a toy and some candy. You got to, there's no way you could look at that video and not feel it. There's no way you could be at that border and not feel it. There's just no way as they're streaming in, and we know that that's not stopping. Many of them, you talk to them, and they were trying to get in touch with their husbands because if you were 18 to 60, they couldn't come across. They did not know whether they would see their husbands or their fathers again. They did not know what life is going to be. Everything in a matter of hours had changed for them. That video echoed that. That's why we went on a trip, and that's why we may have to do some more together. Because if you are a human being, it's got to make you say, this has got to end. I, I thought it was uh, extremely effective. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of the members and many that you'd be surprised by were in tears yeah, watching that. Because it looked like uh, Nazi Germany to me. Mm -hmm. Very reminiscent uh, of that. And you know, we've, we've been to Kiev. We've been to Ukraine when it was a beautiful country, a be and it is, and a beautiful city. But what I thought was very dramatic about the video is it showed you what, how peaceful and happy the country was before Putin struck um, that beautiful country. And I worry what's going to happen to Kiev itself in the next several days. But it showed you how happy the children were, um, very effective uh, with the members of Congress. Um, to see what it was like before, and then to see what it's like now, um, and to see the, the mothers and children and the bodies and the destruction. But in terms of it, the, the policy of a no-fly zone, what do you think it would do to members? You know, I think, again, it goes to his question, at what point is enough enough, right? But no-fly puts us in direct conflict with Russia. You put a NATO aircraft, against a Russian, someone's gonna shoot the other one down and it's automatic World War III. And I think that's what we're trying to prevent. We don't want it to escalate to that, but we wanna give Ukraine everything they can to help them establish a no-fly zone. Um, but I don't know how long the patience is gonna last here. But as President Zelensky said, number one, he still does not need any American pilots, all he wants is the equipment that's necessary to protect the skies. And he very definitely mentioned also the S-300s, which uh, had been negotiated and now apparently is now getting into Ukraine and should be operating very shortly, which I think is extremely important. Yeah, and, and the, resi the resistance has been phenomenal. I mean, we were told it's gonna be over in three to four days. And here we are day, what, I don't know. Yeah, 20 uh, days. and. You know, even today, they're, they're, the Russians are losing in Kyiv. Oh, we never imagined that would happen. It's been very impressive, and our commitment's very strong. And, and, and I'll just say, because on the other piece, about six days before the aggression of Vladimir Putin crossing the line, there was a bipartisan delegation of which I led that was in Ukraine, talking to the Ukrainian people. Looking how beautiful that city and peaceful it was. Not imagining that hospitals, as Mr. McCall was talking about, would be decimated. 
fact of the matter is, I remember talking to an individual who was the CEO of two hospitals. And he was wondering whether those hospitals would continue to stand if, in fact, Putin decided to invade a sovereign country. And then to see those, one of those hospitals now gone, and then to see the video, and then to wonder what's taking place. When we went to Poland, we saw a number of individuals who we met, who I met, at that trip in Ukraine. And they were asking me about, because they got out, but their family members were still left behind, trying to figure out how and what they could do to move their family members to safety. This is a crisis created by one man, and there is a line that he's got to be stopped. Can you offer any sort of update on banning permanent national trade relations with China, sorry, Russia and Belarus? Yeah, I, 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 think, uh, I think the president is leading on that, and then the Congress uh, is as well. You guys are supposed to vote on legislation? In a bipartisan uh, Ways and Means Committee, yeah. yeah. Is that still, do you know if that's still on track to happen? It's uh, still, from yeah. my knowledge, yes. On I, the House floor? It should be this week. I'm not in charge of that. No, but, uh, it should be this week. Yeah. And we are going to do a bipartisan on, the, on our committee markup next week solely on Ukraine and Russia. So we, I'm looking forward mm. to working with Mr. McCall on that. So we're going to be moving forward, and I think that you'll see that Congress, Democrats and Republicans, uh, will be together on the, on the House side and figuring out next steps uh, immediately. To be my, my last question, a bit, uh, yeah. Right, um, there were reports out of Russia that I think it was Peskov floated this idea that um, a, a de-escalation would maybe involve, uh, they suggested Ukraine taking the status of sort of Finland during the Cold War, or Austria in, in a more neutral way, not necessarily joining uh, NATO or the EU, but taking this neutral status. Is that something that uh, you have any thoughts about, given that it seems like the Russians kind of softening their initial position. Well, I think, I think the goal is to wear down the Russians to the, the point where something can be negotiated. But the problem is that they, they were given the diplomacy route, and they, and they turned it down. And the chairman and I agree with that. And so I, I don't, you know, everybody talks about the off-ramp. It's hard to see one right now because he has created this. And I think he's realizing he just, he just created a mess for himself. And now he's a war criminal, and that's going to be his legacy, not reclaiming the glory of the, the, the Soviet empire. It's going to be you're a war criminal. And what is his off-ramp is, I, I think, to your you know, question. And uh, at the end of the day, though, I, I would say that would be up to Mr. Uh, President Zelensky uh, and the Ukrainian people in terms of would they want to give an inch uh, to Putin after what he's done to them. Sure that he doesn't want any Americans uh, flying any MiGs or anything to uh, that respect. Uh, still, a lot of the equipment that he's asking for, uh, whether it's Patriots or whatnot, may need to be operated by Americans. Can that be confirmed? In, uh, no, that's, they only want Russian. They know how to operate anything that's Russian equipment, right? So Patriots ours, we would not put that in Ukraine because of the national security risk if the Russians got it. But the S-300, is like a, it's a smaller scale of Patriot battery, and they can operate that. So and, and that's why the MiGs are a big deal, because the MiGs, not owned by the United States, they're owned by Poland, but they're a Russian plane. And what the deal was back then was we would backfill to the pole right. with F-16s. Uh, and that's showing that we would stand up. And that, but that's why the MiGs are important. We can't just give them you know, F-16s. I mean, if we did, they don't know how to operate them. So that's why the MiGs is a big thing. Mm -hmm. and, and we told the Poles, that we sign off on these foreign military weapons sales. We told the Poles we would <clears throat> approve that sale. Absolutely. Uh, in backfield, you know, get the two F-16s and the troops. And I'm not sure what happened after that. Can the MiGs be handed over then? How does that happen? Well, if the pilots came into Poland, Poland allowed them to fly over, yeah. we backfilled the two F-16s and some more troops for force protection. Paul wants to make sure we got their back, too. Right. They want to know that they have force protection against what Putin is doing. And, you know. Can I just ask what should be the red line here? Yeah. All right, sorry. 